Okay, hi everybody. I'm gonna start actually with a question for you. Um, as you might guess, this is a pretty broad topic, just getting an introduction to specifications grading. And uh, I have several things I wanna talk about, but I may not get to all of them. So tell me what your most important things are. What are the things you want to hear about the most? So you can log in here. You don't need to register anything. Just go here, give me some rankings. And that will tell me if I run short on time, I know what to cut. Because I wanna give you some, some uh, choices here. So the very first thing you're getting is a demo of how I do my classes. Okay, I think I've got a pretty good sense of what we wanna focus on. All right, so as uh, Megan introduced me, I am a professor of teaching here at UC Irvine. And I teach in chemistry. I've been here for quite a while. And the first thing I wanna give you is a sense of what I actually teach. So I teach organic chemistry labs here at UCI. I am uh, trained as an organic chemist. Uh, I teach mostly lab classes. I do get to teach lecture occasionally and I teach very large classes. And when I say large, I'm talking four digits to give you a sense of what large means in my world. Let's do this graphically. Every baby anteater is 100 students. This is an average estimate. I typically have classes that run 1,000, 1,200. I think my current spring quarter class is 1,440 something right now. So this is normal for me. Um, so when I say large, I do mean large. I can't do this by myself. So I have uh, grad student teaching assistants. Some of them are actually here in the audience today. So each of our anteater chemists here represents about six grad students. I currently have 36 TAs for my class. This requires a lot of management. So I have a stalker manager and I have one or two head TAs. Right now I currently have two because managing this online is a lot of work. And then there's me at the top running what I would call maybe a medium-sized company within the university somehow. Uh, so when I say I teach large classes, I am not kidding, which means I do a lot when it comes to grading um, and dealing with letter grades. So I think the last time I, I added up the total enrollments for all my classes over a six year span, it was something like 14,000. So I, I interact with a lot of students on a regular basis. So when I say large, I do mean large. Okay. Um, I also like to do my talks with acknowledgements first because we always run out of time at the end and I think make, giving people credit is really important. So you are going to uh, hear about Kate and Will pretty often and they're both here in the audience. They're also going to be presenting throughout the series coming up. Kate and Will are alumni of our grad program in chemistry at UCI and they're both now in their own careers at Emory and Georgia Tech respectively. And they really helped create the specifications grading system that we use in our, our lab classes here now. So I could not have done this without them and you will hear me mention them repeatedly. Uh, I'm also gonna call out one of my chemistry colleagues, Karen Burke, because uh, he'll show up in a story about how I got here in the first place, how I ended up in specifications grading. Thanks to uh, the Teaching Experiment Academy and Megan, Victoria, Laura and Nikos who really invited me to come in. I'm sure I probably missed a couple people involved in that but asked me to come in and help um, set up the uh, mastery learning and specifications grading project we're working on here and inviting me to kick off the seminar se series. So yay, that's exciting. Um, thanks to the students and the TAs, of course I couldn't do any of this without them and my department for all their support and the dogs because this is remote. So everyone must introduce pets. There are two dogs in the room with me. They may or may not make an appearance at some point but Buster and Apollo are here in the background. You can't see them, but they are here. Dog requests available at the end if you really need to see the dogs. All right, so we're supposed to be talking about specif specifications grading. Before we can do that, we should probably talk about grading in general, the necessary evil, question mark. Is it necessary? I don't know. Uh, grades did not always exist as a thing, but they do, and for all of us, they've existed for as long as we've had to deal with deal with them as students and as instructors. So I thought I would start with um, a quote. I definitely decided to pursue a career that involves teaching because I really love grading and assigning letter grades, said no one ever. None of us chose this career because you're like, you know what I wanna do? I wanna grade things. I wanna assign letter grades to students. This is what I wanna do with my time. No, 
none of this, none of, none of us chose this, right? This is not why we chose to do the job. But it's a part of the job that we do have to do. And I would argue for a lot of us, it's probably one of our least favorite parts of the job. But since we have to do it, we should probably think about what it is that we're doing. Grades are problematic in the best of times. Um, if you want a really good resource on the background, history of grading and different types of grading, this uh, Shinsky and Tanner paper is excellent on this. Quick highlights of grading and its problems. Grading does not actually motivate students. There has been no research that shows that students are actually motivated by the grade. They want to get the grade, but it doesn't motivate them to study. It doesn't motivate them to learn. It just motivates them to get the grade, not the learning part. A lot of us, especially people like me in very large classes, have to use curving. And curving forces competition, whether we want it to or not. If we're grading on a curve, there are a lot of problems with grading on a curve. We are making false assumptions about a normal distribution of students in a class, which is usually not true. We are forcing competition because it's not about getting um, good mastery of a topic. It's about getting more points than the next person so you can get the higher grade. Uh, curving also treats high grades as a scarce resource, which is not true. There is no reason that higher letter grades should be limited. If a student can meet the criteria for a grade, why should they not earn that grade? Bigger problems with norm reference grade, grading or curving is who it actually hurts most. And there is evidence that norm reference grading actually can be most harmful to the students we're most trying to keep in STEM. So the students who are from marginalized groups and getting pushed out of STEM already can be really harmed by this competitive curved grading system. Now, you might be sitting here thinking, well, I don't teach giant classes and I don't have to curve. I have a nice straight point scale, works great. But does it really, I mean, does it really work as well as we, we claim it does? What is a points-based scale telling students? It's not telling students learn these things, it's saying or get these points. It's turning the grading into a game that's focused on points instead of learning. Think about the conversations you have with students and what they're about. How many of them are about points? Another problem with the ways that we've historically graded is that the grade is not something the student's in control of. We might tell them they're in control of earning their grade, but that's not how they see it. Students see grades as a thing that is bestowed upon them by the instructor. Why did you do this to me? Why did you give me this grade as opposed to how did I earn this grade? And so you have probably been in the situation where you've heard a lot of these things. I was always in the situation of dealing with these things, especially with large classes, especially with points and curving is necessary evil. And throughout the 10 plus years, I think I'm up to 12 years now of doing this, um, of, of teaching these large classes, I was saying one thing, right? We all have teaching philosophy statements we've written. You know, look at mine throughout the years of my career and they change over time, of course, but there's some things that are consistent in them. There are things I consistently said I valued in my teaching and what I wanted for students. And I said that learning is collaborative. You should be helping each other learn. We know we don't learn in isolation. We know students need to help each other out to get the best learning experience. Um, I've told students it's okay to make mistakes. That's where learning happens. We mess things up and we learn from it. That is how learning works. I said I wanted them to have a growth mindset. You're not fixed. You're not just good or bad at something. You can improve. Everyone can get better. I told students that I wanted to be transparent about what I'm trying to get them to do. I'm not trying to hide anything from them. I'm not, this isn't a game I'm playing with them. I want to be upfront about it. This is what I said I valued. But let's think about a grading system on points that involves curving and normalizing across all of my sections. And what does that actually mean? What message am I conveying to students with that grading system? I said I wanted you to collaborate, but I'm putting you in a competitive curve grade where your grade depends on someone else's grade. I told you it's okay to make mistakes, but is it really? When do you get to make a mistake and try again? You don't, your points are your points, right? I said, show me that you can improve, but where am I giving that opportunity to improve? You turn in your assessments, you get your points, that's your grade. And I said, we should be transparent. And yet I can't tell you how many times a student came to my office and said, these are my post-lab scores, what do you think my grade is right now? And my response is, I don't know, kind of depends on the other sections and the other students. And I really couldn't tell you. And I just honestly don't know. So one of the things I hated most about my uh, teaching career was that I was being a hypocrite. 
I really, really hated this. Grading was always the part I hated the most. I'm like, I don't feel good about this, but I don't know any other way to do it. And I always had uncomfortable grading interactions. And you might recognize some of these things. Compilations from thousands, thousands, I do mean thousands, of emails I've had from students. And you probably will recognize some of these things yourself. I worked hard in this class. I don't feel my grade reflects the effort I put in. If I had a dollar for every email I had like this, I could probably retire. Right. I'm only a few points away from the next grade. Can you ground me up? Can I or round me up? Can you get and I do some extra credit? My answer was at least partially correct. So I think I deserve more points for this. I need more points because I need to go to med school. Right. And if you have these multi-section classes, you probably run into this one. It's not fair. I have more points than my friend in a different section, but they have a higher grade. Why? Because you have to normalize across the sections and adjust for averages and do all this mathematical things that the students don't understand, right? So I'm seeing from chat, people are recognizing comments from their emails as well, right? We've all seen these things. And a perfectly normal response from us is kids these days, right? <laughs> we turn into like, they don't see the point. It's all about points. It's this game. It's this. And it's simply easy for us to say, you know, it, it, this, it's their fault. But honestly, this is our fault collectively. Students are not born with these ideas. We did this to them. We collectively said, here's the game you should play. We said one thing, but we gave them a completely different message in the way we're grading. And we set ourselves up to get these messages from students because of the messages we've been sending them. But like I said, I couldn't think of a better way to do this until I fell down a grading rabbit hole. So this is where, this is where uh, my colleague Karen Burke's gonna make an appearance. We're gonna have a little story. Back in the days when we got to see each other in person, our department is a pretty uh, collegial department. We tend to celebrate each other's wins. We tend to uh, do a lot of um, like getting together for small things when we can. So back in the before times, there we were. There's a day we were in our department chair's office just on a, like a Friday afternoon, celebrating someone's promotion or someone's award. I can't remember what it was at this point. And I was just chatting with my colleague, Karen, who is a computational chemist. I'm teaching organic chemistry labs. We don't overlap a lot in most of the things that we do other than teaching or just being members of our department. But we were just chatting about teaching one day. And Karen was telling me all these amazing things he was doing in his upper level courses and in his grad courses with students and giving students opportunities to try again. So really bringing in some mastery learning, saying like, you didn't meet the criteria. You didn't get there this time, but that's OK. Try again, show me you can get to these objectives. If you can get to the objectives before the end of the class, you don't need to take the final. But if you didn't meet them, you can take the final and have one last chance to get there. And I'm listening to what Karen's doing and I'm saying, this is amazing. I want to do this. I am so jealous, I want to do this. And Karen says, well, you can do this. And I said, Karen, I teach a thousand students. And he said, no, 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 you can't do this. No, no, you're right, forgot, sorry, you can't. Which is, this is a normal conversation I have with people saying like, 1,000 students. What you can do with 1,000 versus what you can do with 20 is very, very different, right? But anyone who knows me will tell you when my brain gets on a problem, it does not stop. So I went home that night and I just could not stop thinking about this, thinking like, I'm so jealous. I want to be able to do something different. There's got to be something different I can do. So down the Google grading rabbit hole, I went. And I came across things that I already knew. I knew about mastery learning. I'd heard about this before. You know, we give students chances to try again and show that they can master topics before they move on to the next one. But again, I've got a thousand students. I've got 30 plus TAs grading things. I can't ask the TAs to grade over and over and over again. That's not possible. I looked at contract grading, giving students some agency, some choice in their grades. Students can negotiate contract. Here's what I'm gonna do to meet an A criteria. I cannot negotiate with a thousand students. That is not doable. Um, there's other ways to do contract grading where there's a little flexibility where it's kind of laid out, but students can at least pick what they're aiming for and have a few choices. But again, 
large class. So I'm like, not sure how that's going to work. Standards based grading or uh, competency grading saying here, you're, here's the what you need to do to get this grade, meet these criteria, get this grade. It's like, that's great. But I feel again, like I need some of that mastery aspects in there. And how am I going to do this on a thousand student scale? I'm like, I like these things, but none of them are going to quite work for what I'm trying to do or what my limitations are. And then I found specifications grading. And I think I first found it through someone's blog post. Um, a few different blog posts popped up. Then that led me to the Teaching in Higher Ed podcast episode with Linda Nilsson. And then that led me to Linda Nilsson's book. And that triggered a memory of Josh Ring's talk at the Biennial Conference on Chemical Education in 2016. I had actually seen the very tail end of this. I didn't catch all of it. But as I do often, which is a little bit of a problem for me, is I see something done with a class of 20 and I go, yeah, that's nice. Okay, <laughs> not, not gonna work with a thousand. I should have looked more closely because once I came back to this, I thought, you know what, this is perfect. This is what I need. So what is specifications grading and how is it done? Okay, so based on uh, your feedback earlier, you wanted to see um, generally how is this done and the, I think the assessments outcomes were pretty high up there and then rubrics and then letter grades were last. So I'm gonna spend a little time on what it is and how it's done. But I'm gonna pause here to say, feel free to throw things in the chat. You're seeing me look off to the side a little bit over here. I do have two monitors. I've got the chat up. So I'm watching to see what's coming in. As you can see, I've been teaching online for a little while. So I've got this down. So um, as I'm going along, if you have questions, feel free to throw them in the chat and I'll, I'll keep an eye on that. All right, so specifications grading. If you want a quick primer, Linda Nelson's book is an excellent place to start or even her podcast, um, the podcast episode in teaching in higher ed that she's on is, is a good place to start. Um, the book does a great uh, job of kind of laying out the general ideas and giving you some examples. The only challenge I had with it was that there weren't as many STEM examples as I would have liked. And especially like scale for me, like I need the large scale examples. How does this work in large scale? But uh, after looking at some of the things I had found on specifications grading, my brain went to work. I did not get a lot of sleep that night. I filled several notebook pages. And at this time, Kate and Will were TAs in my class. And I walked in to our TA meeting and I said the words they have learned to I don't know if they're excited when I say this, if they're afraid when I say this, but I walked in and said, I have an idea. And they have learned at this point, I'll let them weigh in on how they feel when I say I have an idea. I have a lot of ideas. And said, so we're gonna do this. They were skeptical, but I was like, we can do this. We're gonna figure this out. And we did. So we piloted our specifications grading on a small scale. And for me, small scale was like 40. And we've gone all the way up to our full scale. I'm doing it 1400 now. So to give you a sense of what specifications grading is and how it works, what it does is it combines pieces of these other grading systems, so pieces of mastery learning, the ability to revise and resubmit work, and to setting passing thresholds. You have to meet this level, showing this level of mastery to get credit for this assignment. Brings that piece in. Brings in another piece from uh, competency-based uh, learning or, or um, standards-based learning you have to show me certain degrees of competency, competency or proficiency in, in these criteria to meet this letter grade. Brings in aspects of contract grading as well. Here is what you do need to do to meet this grade. If you are aiming for a C in this class, these are the criteria. You meet these criteria, you earn this grade, end of story. Okay. Same for Bs, same for A, plus or minus if, you, if your university deals with plus minus grades as well. That also gives students some ownership. We want to encourage students to aim for higher grades, but at the same time, it is their choice. They are adult humans and they are allowed to make choices. And if a student says, I'm just trying to pass because I need to graduate. Meanwhile, I have my two jobs and I'm helping support my family. And look, look I know an A is good, but I need a C because I just need to be done. I respect that. And they should be allowed to make that choice because I may have made that choice sometimes myself. So it's okay, they should be allowed to make those choices. So we're bringing in all of these pieces of these other grading systems, but we're adding a special piece that also really helps, which is the token economy. So how do we limit things like a, a re, um, revision and resubmission to make it manageable for the instructor? 
So specifications grading can be kind of accomplished in a few different ways. And I think this is like second or third on the list. So I'm gonna spend just a little time on this one. Um, if you want a good reference for like different ways to organize your bundles of assignments for your letter grades, or another way to think of that is we call, we tend to call them grade trackers. Uh, there's this soy reference here um, from Georgia Gwinnett. They looked at a variety of STEM courses at their university using specifications grading and categorized them into like three different categories. So one of the ways to do this is to set up core and advanced objectives. And this is pretty common in courses that are part of a sequence or are prereqs for things. So we see this a lot in general chemistry. Um, we see this a lot in calculus. Um, bio people, where are you on the specs grading? I can't find any bio examples. Biologists need to get on this. I don't know where you are. If you're out there doing it, let me know because we are scouring like all the references and we can't find the biologists. So I don't know where they're hiding. So please let us know. Um, so in this case, you tend to do core objectives. Like here are the essential things you need to do to pass this class because you're going to need them in the next class in the sequence. That's your minimum for passing. And then all other objectives are the higher level objectives or more advanced objectives. So if you want to earn a higher level grade, you need to meet some of those higher level objectives. Another way to organize and connect your learning objectives to your grade outcomes to get away from this points game is to say all equal objectives. So it's like, here are all the objectives for the class. We're not treating any as more or less important than the others. Uh, usually, although sometimes there's a little bit of core in there. And in general, more objectives equals higher grades. The third and least common way we've seen these, uh, seen specifications grading implemented is through modules. So this can be core and objective or core and advanced objectives or all equal. It really depends on how people want to structure it, but they package their objectives into modules, into bins essentially, and more modules equals higher letter grades. Sometimes there's a one or more essential modules, like you must pass this one to pass the class, and then you can add more modules to get a higher grade, uh, or other times it's just meet X number of modules to get the grade. So this one varies a lot. So it brings in a little bit of core advanced or all, all equal, depending on how it's organized. But the things that all of these have in common is clearly here are the objectives you need to meet in the class. Here is how you meet those objectives. Here is how those objectives translate to a letter grade. Very transparent. The other thing that they tend to have is some choice. Even if you're doing core and advanced, when it comes to the advanced objectives, the students have some choices about which advanced objectives they want to target, depending on how you structure the grading. So I'll do just a couple of examples for these. Um, a good example, the, well, the first example I came across was Josh Ring's uh, work in organic chemistry lecture course. And he, what Josh did was to organize the um, objectives into essential and general. And the essential were the things that you absolutely need to go on to organic chemistry too. So those of you who teach chemistry, we know kind of what we're talking about here. These are really fundamental things like, can you draw basic structures? Can you do resonance structures? Can you predict acidity? Really straightforward things that if you don't master these now, you will fail the next classes in the sequence. And then the higher level things were added on top of those to get to more advanced grades. A similar version in discrete math for Carlisle. This is a really good reference for uh, math people. There's a discrete math and different differential equations in this uh, example in the same paper. So for the discrete math, Carlisle's work was uh, mainly centered around core and advanced problems. But if you actually read the paper, it's really objective. The problems are objectives. So each problem centered around an objective in, in the class. Uh, but you will see there are still some other things in here. So passing worksheets, and there is still a final exam component with a passing threshold. Got another one from engineering. So uh, engineering, uh, Mendez. So, uh, Julie Mendez is actually one of our speakers later in the series. Julie did Julie's paper, uh, has just two actually from conference proceedings, one in-person thermodynamics engineering class and one hybrid. So if you're looking for what does this look like hybrid, there's a good example. And in this case, uh, core learning targets, minimums to pass the class plus additional for higher letter grades. And then one that's unpublished, you won't find anywhere except for talking to me. This is from my summer 2020 lecture class. 
Um, I only get to teach lecture in the summer. I cram 10 weeks into five weeks. And the way I organized mine was actually really similar to Josh Ring's where I figured out what are the core objectives that I know students will need to be successful in the next class. That's your minimum for passing. And then higher letter grades is the higher level objectives added on top of that. So really similar thing. Um, so question in the chat, are there other, are there disciplines other than STEM? Yes, definitely. Um, I can point you to some of those at the end if you remind me, or Kate, if you wanna add some of our, uh, some pull some out of our reference list, you can add those. Okay, so the other category, uh, one of the other categories was all equal objectives. So uh, Julie Mendez also has an example of that for one of her other courses where it is, uh, they were no longer doing core and advanced. There's no, you must meet these objectives. Instead, it's here are the objectives for, for the course. You have to meet at least 11 to pass, plus a present, a, uh, a project, and then higher letter grades as you go on. Okay, there's a question. Let me see the question. Are there examples for this being used as a gateway to stay in a course? I have not seen that. Um, Will or I know Will or Kate or Will and Kate are both here, um, and they might have. I, I can't remember seeing anything like that so far, which means it's a great place for someone to explore. Uh, another example for all equal objectives is comes from uh, Carlisle's in the differential equations. So, for discrete math, it was core and advanced. For differential equations, it's now all equal. So 20 problems must pass a certain number to pass the course. Okay. So again, you can see even within, uh, for one instructor, you may choose to do a core and advanced or an all equal, just depending on what your course is, what the objectives are, where your course fits in the curriculum overall. So you can, there's a lot of variety here. For uh, organized by module, you're gonna find a lot fewer of these. We actually looked quite extensively to find examples we could highlight and we didn't find that many. So one version you might want to look at if you're interested in just organizing by module. Um, there are some in the Linda Nelson's book that are kind of organized this way, but they're not uh, as STEM focused. And since we're STEM focused, I wanted to pick a STEM class for you. Um, in the Georgia Quinnett uh, overall overview of all of their specifications grading courses, there is the calculus class where um, objectives are grouped into modules. And there's an essential module everyone has to pass. And then after that, the number of other modules you pass determines your letter grade. And just to highlight again, students get to choose. There's not a requirement you have to pass these modules for a higher letter grade. You get to pick which ones you pass. All right, so notice I have not mentioned my class other than my lecture here at all. I've not talked about my thousand person lab class. That is because as I was trying to design a system for my thousand person lab class, as almost always happens to me because most people don't think about lab classes and most people don't teach a thousand students. I'm just at like nothing is designed for me at all. So I had to come up with a, my own system and I have named it the very not creative equal objectives with repetition and increased difficulty because I did not know what else to call it. So if you've got a better name for this, please let me know. So the way this one is a little bit different than the others is it really is about how the objectives are structured in the class. So in a lab class, it's really different than a lecture. I don't have like certain objectives kind of organized by chapter or module. I have big picture objectives. So I'm teaching a lab course. I want students to show me that they can do certain lab skills. I want them to show me that they can analyze data appropriately and make claims backed up by evidence. Um, I want them to demonstrate some safety knowledge. But these aren't packaged into discrete assessments because they're repeated over different experiments. And part of showing me that you can do this is showing me that you can apply it to new situations, right? So none of these other ways of organizing the objectives and grades worked for me. So what we came up with instead is we have core objectives or course objectives that are spread out and repeated over multiple assessments in multiple ways. So there's a minimum level you need to show me to pass, but to earn higher letter grades, you show me more repetitions and higher order assessments to get to that higher letter grade. So to give you an idea of how this works, this is our part uh, from our original grade tracker. So minimum to earn a C in our original version of the class was 
certain thresholds on our smaller pieces of assessments like online homework, pre-lab video quizzes, but the core really centered around our major assessments, which are lab notebook assessments, lab notebook assignments, and post-lab assignments. For, so for a C, fewer required, and for an A or a B, more required. And then for an A, there's a few other assessments that aren't required at the lower levels. So again, showing me you can do these things over and over um, and apply to different situations and at higher levels of difficulty for higher grades. I just wanted to highlight after reorganizing my lecture class, I thought, you know what, this is a much better way to show the grade tracker. So I actually updated my grade tracker. It looks more like this now. And um, this is the one for my actual current class right now. And uh, so it's the same ideas, but to pass the class, there's a minimum of certain assignments. And then certain, uh, these last pieces are exam, final exam pieces. So for a higher grade, there are more things that you need to pass. And then these smaller things like the online homework and the pre-lab video quizzes, I pulled those out of the main letter grades. And this was inspired by Julie Mendez's work. And I have that, uh, that now is how you get your plus or minus. So if you meet certain criteria, you get a plus. If you fall below certain criteria, you end up with a minus on your letter grade. Turns out this actually works really well for writing classes. So I'm gonna highlight um, highlight Kate's work and also my colleague, Steve Meng, who's gonna, and Kate and Steve are gonna talk about this in a couple of weeks. They designed a writing for chemists class. So this is an upper level writing class specifically for our chemistry majors. And then it turns out that um, this idea of a few main objectives for the course, but repeating them through multiple assessments and higher levels of difficulty for higher grades works well in a writing class as, as well. So Kate and Steve's work here. So uh, a few things to get C's, more things to get A's. You'll also, you'll also notice there's low pass, high pass. I'm gonna talk about that in just a minute. Okay. So four main ways to organize your objectives to meet your letter grades, but there are other examples out here that don't really fit neatly into any of these categories. So one thing I wanna emphasize really quickly as I'm, I'm seeing things come through the chat and we'll look at that in just a second. But one of the things I wanna emphasize is there's no one way to do this. The way to do this is the way that works for your class, your objectives, your students. Okay? So don't feel like there is a way to do specifications grading. Make it your own, do what works for you. Okay, so passing means a certain threshold. Yes, I'm going to show you what passing means in just a minute. Um, it, it, you get to decide what that threshold is. So I'll show you some examples. Uh, is the grading information available throughout the semester? Absolutely. I give the grade tracker on day one. And one of the things I do is I actually do a mid-quarter grade check. In the middle of the quarter, I say, get your grade tracker out, mark off what you've met, what is your plan to meet the things you haven't met, um, have you made a huge mistake that you need to talk to me about immediately before it's too late? All right, so rubrics and tokens. Let's talk about rubrics really quickly. There are a variety of ways you can set up what passing means for your assignments. And this is really up to you, honestly. Uh, pretty common is that we have, uh, most people go with about an 80-ish percent threshold. So the way most of my rubrics are set up is binary pass, no pass. And even the rubric items themselves are signed up, uh, set up as binary pass, no pass. So I'll show you an example in just a second. But uh, here's the rubric for the assignment. Each rubric item is yes, no, you met it or you did it. You pass the assignment by meeting at a minimum number of rubric items or higher. So I typically set mine at about 80%, although um, you know, if, if the difference, if it comes down to like 74% versus 82, because it's just one rubric item difference, then I'll, I'll go a little bit lower rather than higher. Um, there's no partial credit. Either you met, met the threshold or you didn't. If you're one rubric item below the threshold, you did not meet it. You need to revise and resubmit if you want credit for the assignment. Another way you can structure this is high pass, low pass, no pass, which is the way Steve and Kate have their structured. I'm not gonna say a lot about it because they're gonna talk about that more in their talk, but I'll give you just a quick preview. Um, and there's the way they have their rubric set up, it is binary for the rubric items, but there are multiple thresh passing thresholds. So you can pass at a low pass level or a high pass level. And that's set by the number of rubric items you meet. Uh, low pass, a set, um, hitting low pass on assessments gets you lower letter grades than hitting high pass on, on assessments. And again, no partial credit. You either met the threshold or you didn't. 
Um, there are some people using multi-level rubrics or thresholds. This gets a little closer to points, but it is a thing you can do. For example, in uh, Julie, one of Julie Mendez's examples, there, uh, the assessments are marked on an um, exceeds expectations, meets, needs revision, or not accessible scale. So you can pull in those if you want. And then so, many of us, honestly, I was gonna say some, but honestly, most of us still have some assignments that are points-based because there's just not another good way to do it. Um, for example, like, you know, pre-lab video quizzes, it, it's hard to get away from points in those, mainly because the learning management systems are really not set up for that. They are trying to force you into points. So sometimes it's not worth the battle to get away from the points there. But even in those, a lot of times we set a passing threshold. Like you must get this percent or higher for it to count. Okay. So quick example of um, how you might redesign a rubric. This is from one of my rubrics from before and after. So I had a criteria that had a seven point scale. You could get partial credit, five, three, one. I was looking for specific things. When we modified this for specifications grading, we realized we really needed to break this rubric item up into smaller pieces and then make it binary. So rather than having this all together, we've, I've split it up into separate parts and then it's either yes or no. You either met this or you didn't. You met this or you didn't. There's no trying to decide, is this worth five points? Is this worth three points? Either yes, you did it or no, you didn't. Um, I mentioned I have a lot of grad students, TAs. They're the ones who are doing a lot of this grading. Some of, at least one, is in the audience right now, so can weigh in on this as well. But uh, the grad students in general tell me it is easier to decide whether a, whether a student's work meets this criteria, yes or no, than it is to decide how many partial credit points it's worth. And so that might help to standardize grading across multiple graders a little bit. I don't have solid evidence to say that it is or not, so I want to be careful about that. Um, but we're hoping it standardizes things a little better. And then I saw the questions in the chat rolling in about how do you manage retakes? OK, this is where the token system comes in. The tokens are set up to let you limit the number of times students can revise and resubmit things. So it's not just free for all, just keep revising and resubmitting until you get it right. It is you have tokens and you use them to trade for a revise and resubmit. So now the students have to think about, OK, is it worth resubmitting this or should I just let this go and move on to the next assignment? And do I need to make sure I'm really trying on the first pass so that I can don't so that I don't need to revise and resubmit because I have a limited number of chances to do that? I also use the tokens to incentivize good habits. So I set my tokens up that you, uh, you earn your tokens up front by doing things that I want you to do anyway, like planning out how you're going to tackle your assignments throughout the quarter. When is your study time? Right now I'm using Allison Flynn's um, online learning plan where students actually fill in, how am I going to take care of my physical health, my mental health? What is my schedule? How do I set boundaries with my roommates or my family? I have them fill that in at the beginning of the quarter. Uh, they do that. I give them four tokens for whatever they submit. I try to go and comment on them just to, so they know I look at them. And then I give opportunities for additional tokens throughout the, the quarter. Um, I incentivize things like I do, right now I'm doing a mid-quarter class engagement check. Like how are engaged are you in the class right now? What are you doing? And I think Sadie is in the audience. And yes, I totally borrowed this from you, Sadie. Um, I also do that mid-quarter grade check. I give students a token for going in and checking where they are to make sure they're not surprised by something they didn't realize they had to do. So I'm incentivizing all those good behaviors and I incentivize metacognitive strategies through this. Um, the tokens also remove the need for me to judge many requests. When I used to get emails, can I have an extra day to do this? How do I decide who gets an extra day? Ah, hate doing that. I don't have to do that anymore. If you want an extra 24 hours, that will cost you one token, please. I don't need to know why. You do not have to give me a story. It is fine. Trade a token, no questions asked. It doesn't matter what it's for. I don't need to know. I don't need to judge these things. I don't want to judge these things. It's not my business, right? I still encourage students to tell me if something big is happening and they need more help. But these Simple, like I just need an extra day because I just forgot or I'm overwhelmed or whatever happened, 
I no longer have to deal with it. It's just 24 hours for a token. We're good. No questions asked. How do I manage this? Google form. <laughs> I have a Google form. Uh, it is shared between me and my two head TAs. Uh, we, the students go in and put in their token requests. It's very structured. So they know what they're asking for and how many, what the token cost is for the thing they're asking for. And then we use a dummy assignment in Canvas um, that is their token balance. And then we just update it there and we leave comments so that we know that it has been uh, done. Tokens are great. I love them. It just removes so much of the stress from everything. The students really like them too. I will say though, you have to convince the students to use them. They like to hoard them. They're like, I'm going to hoard all of my tokens and never use them for anything. So I have to keep reminding them there's no reward for the most tokens at the end of the quarter. <laughs> this is not a thing. Please use them. That's what they're here for. I saw some questions about um, the online learning plan. I will find that and put it in the chat at the end. That's Allison Flynn at University of Ottawa. Um, how many tokens are typically given? I think mine right now, they can get up to about seven or eight by the end of the quarter, but it really is up to you. Okay, um, people wanted to see gains in assessments. So I pulled a couple of these. There's not a lot of literature on this, but a few things that we were able to find. Uh, Josh Ring's work. Josh went and looked at his class uh, with, with that was points-based and his class that was specifications grading based and looked at the final exam and then assessments on specific core topics for organic chemistry. Regraded the points-based class without using partial credit. So like, how would these students compare if there's no partial credit option? In most cases, they're doing better. A few where it's not so much, but acid-base explanations are really tough. I'm not surprised to see this as an organic chemist, like, yeah. <laughs> that does not surprise me. Um, but across the board, for the most part, doing better. Uh, math version. In discrete math, Carlisle example, uh, final exam scores for points-based are in white here. Um, yellow is the specifications grading version. So across the board, final exam scores are going up in discrete math. Did not see the same thing in differential equations, though. There's a good ex uh, discussion of that in the paper. Uh, Julie Mendez is also kind of a little bit mixed here. So this is um, the hybrid thermodynamics class. So looking at specific uh, learning targets, in some cases doing better in uh, points, in some cases better in the hybrid, in the hybrid specifications grading. These are all uh, proctored in-person assessments. They are not online unproctored assessments. So there is more direct comparison there, I'm a little bit mixed. That's about all that's out there for specific ass assessments. And um, there's not a lot of this. We're actually working on that ourselves, but we've been a little slow because remote teaching. So we haven't got to, we'll, we'll get there. As soon as we can stop reinventing classes, lab classes online, if we can ever stop doing that. I will get back to the other things. Quick note on gains in letter grades. So we do see some examples of letter grades going up. So the discrete math example, um, A's and B's are going up across the board here for the students in the spec system here. All right, there should be a graph here that shows the, the uh, department average versus the uh, specifications grading class. There were fewer D's, F's, and withdrawals for the specifications grading course and a higher number of B's, although not a higher number of A's. This is a general chemistry class. And I really wanna highlight this one. This is, um, Holland said, this is from Howard University. So a historically black university. We, uh, no change in the DFW rate, which was not what, not what um, they were hoping for. However, A's went up under the specifications grading. So the students were more able to reach that A level, but still hoping to move the DFW rate. So there may be some more things that need to, more interventions may be needed to help get the DF and the W up. But I really wanted to highlight this one because we had talked about norm or the curve grading being potentially more harmful for students from um, historically marginalized or groups that are pushed out of STEM and seeing more A's for students at a historic, historically black university is really promising. We can show you this ourselves. So here's our classes. Uh, this is medium and large laboratory course. So uh, these were both in back in person. This is not online. This is when we are still in person. Medium for me is 200. 
uh, large is was about 1200, I think, somewhere between 1000 and 1200 total. Um, so the purple is points based, the teal is specifications grading. So in both cases, the letter grades are going up pretty significantly here. I really want to point out the medium lab course, though, because this one is off sequence. Think about what we know about off sequence classes. So these are students that are in a, uh, not the regular kind of fall, winter, spring. For us, it's winter, it's just winter, spring, but you know, your typical like start in this course, go to this course, go to this course sequence. The students in the off sequence class have, are there for a variety of reasons, but for many, it is the fact that they are um, behind because they had to start in a preparatory course instead of like general chemistry, for example, they had to start intro chem or because they have failed a chemistry class somewhere along the way. And the fact that we're seeing a huge jump in the letter grades for these students is really promising. And this is something we're working on, trying to see what's going on here. We actually do have um, common exam questions across both of these groups and the on-sequence counterpart that we're trying to compare, which we will do as soon as we can stop reinventing remote labs. So give us another year, maybe we'll get to that part. Right, so I want to just wrap up with a couple of things here. I promised to tell you a bit about relationships, and we went into the weeds of specifications grading for a minute. But let's back up and look about those big look at back at those big picture things we were talking about at the beginning. Right. How does this change relationships? For me, as an instructor, it's changed my relationship to grading. I still don't love grading. I would love to not have to do this, but I don't think that's a thing I can actually control at this point. The university says you must give grades, so I guess I must give grades if I want to keep my job. Um, but I can change how it is connected to my teaching. And so my grading system now much more matches my teaching philosophy. Students are not in competition. If every student in my class met the A threshold, they would all earn A's, end of story. And I'm not concerned about grade inflation because it's not inflation if you set the standards and they met the standards. That's not grade inflation. That's called letting students earn the grade they earned by meeting the objectives, right? Um, for my in relationship with students, in their, in their relationship with me, our conversations have changed. Yes, I still get emails about grades, but it's not about, can you round me up? It's not about points. It's about, please help me understand why my work isn't meeting the standards you set. And that is a fundamentally different conversation. The students have a different relationship with the grades and their work. They get to make mistakes and try again. And the students have a fundamental different, fundamentally different relationship with their peers. Their peers are now their collaborators, not their competitors. So this is a, a, an excerpt from an email I got from a student about two weeks ago. I did ask permission. I actually said, Angie, would you want me to take your name off of this? And she said, no, please leave my name on it because I think it matters more if I do. So I did offer to anonymize it. And she said, absolutely not. You will put my name on this. Like, okay. So I'll give you a second to read it. And, then, and this is the answer to, this is why I do what I do. So it really is changing the relationship to the learning and to the grades and to the instructor for the student and to their peers as well. So this is doable. We do not have to grade the way we were graded. If there's one thing I want you to take away from this, we don't have to do what was done to us. We can do something different. The students appreciate it. They're still gonna complain about certain things. It's normal, we all complain, it's okay. It's not ever going to be perfect, but they appreciate that it's transparent, it's not competitive, it allows for learning from mistakes. You'll find this repeated anecdotally in almost every paper on specifications grading. I know we might have a couple of um, chem ed research or other deeper people in the audience. It'd be great if we could get some actual qualitative research on this. Anybody's looking for a project. It can work at scale. If I can do it with a thousand, you can do it with your class. I promise it's possible. And we can give students a more supportive environment to really get gains in their learning and their letter grades overall. So things you might be thinking right now, and I see some of you are thinking it because I see it in the chat. I don't have time to do this or I'm afraid to do it all at once. Can I do it in pieces? Yes, you can. Uh, we're gonna talk about that. In fact, Will's gonna talk about this next week where he's brought in pieces when he couldn't do a full conversion. What does it look like to get from mastery to specifications grading? We've got that coming up. 
How does this work in remote and hybrid classes? That's coming up as well. How do you design for upper level or very large classes? Uh, Steve and Kate will tell you about some upper level classes. I will tell you more details on how I design this for my massive class later in the series. And if you want, if you're saying, you know what, this isn't enough for me. I want to go really radical. We have at the, the very end, we're wrapping up with ungrading. So I'm going to end right there and see if I've missed any major things in the chat, but it looks like I've been managing to get most of them as I go. So I dig my acknowledgments earlier, but thank you all for letting me proselytize maybe <laughs> about grading and how we can definitely do this differently. Mm -hmm.